On Monday, we discussed how physical cash may become a casualty of crisis and how the Fed would justify making cash painful to hold in order to fight deflation and proclaim they've saved the economy. Yet, there are other more devious reasons for this re-engineering of society away from physical cash. A cashless society is easily monitored, controlled, manipulated, weaponized, and locked down, and would play right into the hands of those wanting absolute power. The war on terror has prepared us for such a development. The normalization of crisis produces a situation in which repealing of measures brought in to deal with the emergency becomes unimaginable. When will the war be over became when will the crisis end? The ever-present threat becomes the justification. To quote 1984, Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Now, what we need to realize is that we're not just dealing with a pandemic and an economic crisis. We are dealing with a crisis of meaning, a crisis of trust, and a crisis of truth itself. To me, this represents the central fulcrums of our time. How do you define truth and trust in a digital age? How can we possibly ascertain what is objectively true or false when we are barraged with a fire hose of information every day? Especially when many of those who demand our attention, politicians, the media, advertisers, also play to our underlying emotions. So let's first address truth. In part, we can see the current state of truth reflected in the post-truth condition of current discourse. Post-truth was defined as the word of the year in 2016 by the Oxford English Dictionary, defining it as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And yet, what I find ironic is that this is a post-truth definition of post-truth itself. It's how those dominant in the relevant knowledge and power game want their opponents to be seen, labeling their motivations as purely emotional, allowing them to gain competitive advantage in some more or less defined field of play. After all, it was Plato who realized that the only way to curb democracy's chaotic tendencies was to ensure that discussions about the rules of the game and one's position in the game are kept separate. We can debate one or the other, but not both at once. And that is the truth condition. Conversely, the post-truth condition challenges that assumption as players jockey for position in the current game while at the same time trying to change the rules so as to maximize their overall advantage. And it's no wonder that people are frustrated. They know the game has been rigged while being told it's not. You don't have to look at Brexit or Trump to see that the post-truth condition is here to stay. The post-truth disrespect for established authority is ultimately offset by its conceptual openness to previously ignored people and their ideas. They are encouraged to come to the forefront and prove themselves on this expanded field of play. It's the democratization of truth itself. In this respect, the post-truth condition marks a triumph of democracy over elitism, albeit one that potentially tilts the balance towards chaos over order. So in part, I draw inspiration for trying to understand the search for trust and truth in a digital age from texts like Simulacra and Simulation, a 1981 philosophical treatise that served directly as the inspiration behind The Matrix, a film that depicts the dystopian future in which humanity is unknowingly trapped inside a simulated reality. The Matrix, which was created by machines to distract humans while using their bodies as an energy source. And no, I'm not suggesting that we're plugged into a simulation like The Matrix. But what I find interesting is if you watch the beginning of The Matrix, Neo keeps his pirated software in a hollowed out copy of Simulacra and specifically at the chapter on nihilism, where nihilism is defined as extreme skepticism maintaining that nothing in the world has a real existence. And at this point in the story, his extreme skepticism of his reality is leading him towards finding Morpheus. Additionally, Morpheus begins his big reveal of what the real world truly is by quoting, Welcome to the desert of the real. A quote from Simulacra highlighting the lack of distinction between reality and representation. In that, we can draw parallels where our own reality is defined by our perspective and the representations we use to understand the world around us. As humans, we shape our entire worldview through our innovations. 
Through the lens of our technology, we see reality with a new perspective. The humans that developed fire and tools and agriculture and so on saw the world very differently than those who came before. This innovation perspective shift has led us to where we are today. While there are many ways in which life has become incredibly complex, the proliferation of digital communication technologies and the glut of information that flows through them has created a situation of constant overstimulation with insufficient time to pause and reflect on the data in order to form coherent perspectives. You know, we read a news item, an opinion piece, or analysis, and seconds later, innumerable other contradictory yet seemingly credible views vie for our attention. This, in turn, creates a situation we could call heuristic failure. Heuristics are like rules of thumb. They're strategies which we use to solve problems, to understand, and to navigate our lives. Heuristics form the basis of our consciousness. So when the world ceases to be predictable and consistent in a way that allows us to develop stable heuristics, well, we become overwhelmed, experiencing ourselves as adrift, without meaning, and even unable to form a coherent collection of long-term memories that tells us a story of who we are and where we're going. <laughs> and simply, we're not very good at surviving this state of existential exhaustion. Humans under such duress tend to awaken a mental flight to safety. A desperate search for meaning. If a solution can be presented as providing existential stability and meaningfulness, it becomes highly desirable. We are pushed to seek comfort and convenience at the cost of control. And we see that today. In much the same way that Americans have opted into government surveillance through the conveniences of GPS devices and cell phones, Digital cash, the means of paying with one's debit card or credit card or cell phone, is becoming the de facto means of commerce and hence the means of enforcement. Much like the war on drugs and the war on terror, the so-called war on cash is being sold to the public as a means of fighting terrorists and drug dealers and tax evaders and now COVID-19 and consumer fear. Despite all the advantages that go along with living in a digital age, namely convenience, it's hard to imagine how a cashless world navigated by way of a centralized digital wallet doesn't signal the beginning of the end for what little privacy we have left or the freedoms we value. That's because the real reason for this war on cash, you know, starting with the big bills and then working their way down, is that ultimately it's an ugly power grab. People will have less privacy as electric commerce makes it easier for Big Brother to see what we're doing thereby making it simpler to ban activities it doesn't like. Just look to China, where a social credit score is backed by a system where physical cash is banned. And this lets the government decide who can buy plane tickets or which children get into national universities, all under the justification that it enables better social behavior. To our detriment, we have virtually no control over who accesses our private information, how it is stored, or how it is used. In terms of our bargaining power over digital privacy rights, we have been reduced to a pitiful, unenviable position where we must beg for the right to own our own privacy and data. Put simply, digital currency provides the government and its corporate partners with the ultimate method to track, control, and punish. Short of returning to a pre-technological Luddite age, there's really no way to reverse this process. I mean, this is the nature of technology. It's neither good nor evil only the amplifier of intent. So this begs the question, what is the answer to our current crisis? Well, the important lesson in this crisis of truth and trust and meaning is that suffering is the answer. And of course, you have to ask, why is that? Well, let's start by talking about a concept you might be familiar with, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It describes a pyramid of human needs and that the needs lower down must be satisfied before individuals can attend to the needs higher up. We need food and water first before we can attend to psychological needs like belonging and self-esteem. So what Maslow theorized was at the very top of the hierarchy, the need only made possible if other motivational issues are met and mastered, is self-actualization, the need to try to be one's best self to be free to achieve one's stated desires. But I think he was wrong. After all, well-fed people with money in the bank and encouragement, in theory, 
should be striving for more creativity, altruism, self-transcendence, and serving those who struggle with their own needs. However, given so many people in modern society with basic needs met are still bored and frustrated and despairing and not necessarily seeking betterment but subjugation, I think this speaks to something else. Instead of self-actualization, I believe it is suffering that is the highest level of our needs. Let me explain. A central Buddhist teaching is that all life is suffering. But what is the purpose of suffering, and therefore life itself, if suffering is a constant and unavoidable? Have we not always struggled with truth and trust and meaning? How does suffering as a constant address these other constants that we can never truly overcome? Well, you see, suffering is not only a need, but also is the basis, the key, to our higher consciousness. It is the teacher, the motivator, the guide, and the voice that has been whispering to us all along. For every great triumph, we've also had a great tragedy. For every golden age, we've also had a dark age. As the universe pushes against us, we push back. We can also describe suffering by one of the laws of the universe itself, entropy. Put simply, entropy is a measure of disorder. And here's the crucial thing about entropy. By the laws of this universe, entropy always increases. Things break down. Things change. Nothing is truly permanent. Life is therefore suffering because it is impermanent and ever-changing. This is synonymous with saying that suffering is not only our nature, it is nature itself and it is teaching us through the ever-present need to adapt and change and grow to fight that suffering. We can also think of suffering and entropy as described by Murphy's Law, which states that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> a reference is the annoying tendency of life to cause trouble and make things difficult. Problems seem to arise naturally on their own, while solutions always require our attention, energy, and effort. Life just never seems to work itself out for us. If anything, our lives become more complicated and gradually decline into disorder rather than remain simple and structured. And it's no one's fault that life has problems. It's simply a law of probability. There are many disordered states and few ordered ones. Given the odds against us, what is remarkable is not that life has problems, but that we can solve them at all. We can either embrace nihilism and decide that chaos is the natural order, or we can decide not to go gentle into that good night and rage, rage against the dying of the light. Our suffering has to be grasped as an enormous opportunity. The very oppressive pervasiveness of a dysfunctional status quo means that even glimmers of alternative political and economic possibilities can have a disproportionate great effect. The tiniest event, or microbe, can tear a hole in the gray curtain of reaction which has marked the horizons of possibility under modern society. From a situation in which nothing can happen, suddenly anything is possible again. But ultimately, it's important for us to reflect and understand so that the future is less opaque and that life is less scary. Ultimately, we all experience this together, and that's why having a community like this is so valuable and why I appreciate your support so much. To keep up the conversation and to talk to us directly, we've opened up our Discord for our trading channel so that we can talk about the future of technology and markets together and to have a better understanding as to how to find opportunity even in a crisis. If you'd like to better act upon that, we've also opened up our new service, Ready, Set, Trade, which is all about teaching you to be a better trader and how to develop a system to make $100 every day through using smart strategies and options. You can check out what we're doing over at readyset.trade and don't forget to use the code LAUNCH at checkout to get a 20% discount. So until the next one, thanks so much for watching. If you haven't done so already, please like and subscribe, and I look forward to talking with you in the comment section below. Cheers.